and welcome to our uh, next in the series of our webinars for Abacus. I am delighted to welcome Dr. Javier Garcia Oliva, who studied law at the University of Cadiz, where he obtained his first degree, his LLM and his PhD. He's a senior lecturer in law at the University of Manchester, where he's currently the acting associate dean for business engagement at the Faculty of Humanities. And he is also the academic champion for Aspect, who are currently funding the Abacus project. Javier's research interests are constitutional law, particularly the position of sub-state entities such as Catalonia, Scotland and Quebec, and human rights with an emphasis on religious freedom. He has published widely in these fields, including his 2017 Routledge book, Religion, Law and the Constitution, Balancing Beliefs in Britain, which he co-authored with Helen Hall. Also with Helen and Tom Lewis, both at Nottingham Trent University, Javier has devised a board game called Brave New World, which aims to increase awareness among young people and other social groups of the significance of human rights, democracy and the rule of law. Furthermore, Javier is a teaching fellow at the University College London, a lecturer in Spanish law at the University of Oxford, a research associate at the Centre for Law and Religion at Cardiff University, a visiting professor at the University of Sevilla, and visiting professor at Schulich School of Law, Dalhousie University in Canada. Javier is also the membership secretary of the UK Constitutional Law Association, the book review editor of Law and Justice. Javier, I have just reeled off a huge long list of accomplishments, titles and professorships. But what would your parents describe you as what you do for a living? No, that's really a Morven. First of all, thank you very much for having me here. It's a real uh, honour. Um, I think your initiative is absolutely brilliant and I am very humbled to be joining you today. Well, I think it, it would be a very simple answer if you ask my parents and a, and a teacher and that's uh, definitely the way I feel. I teach uh, the future generations of uh, people here in, in the United Kingdom. Um, I am very, very privileged to be taking part in such a great uh, endeavor. Of course, at the same time, my parents would say, well, he writes. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I do. I write, I think the research side is uh, also extremely important for us academics, but the way I see it is uh, two parts of the same job teaching and research but you need to be you need to be passionate about both of them then when i meet people who claim that they are not very keen on teaching for instance at the university level i i know there are a few very very few positions uh, as an academic in which you can avoid uh, doing any teaching but i think that should be rather exceptional i think uh, I generally consider those people who claim that they don't like and their heart is not into teaching are really probably not in the right job, but I obviously respect everybody's uh, choices. Okay, and I suppose then, um, so I mentioned in my introduction that you have devised a board game. Do you see that board game as a kind of, um, as a tool of teaching different types of people? Um, do you see it as a research um, as a research project, how do you, or do you see it as a mixture of both? How do you see that project? Um, and what made you want to do a board game? Because commercialization of a board game isn't isn't a traditional thing that we do in, in social science. Yeah, no, that's such, a, that's such a good question. It's very, very interesting. Uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, Morven, I, I wrote this book with my colleague Helen Hall at Nottingham Trent University. Let me just tell you, if I may, a little bit about the background of why Please. we decided to put forward this board game. We wrote this book, which was on the UK constitution. We focus on England, Scotland and Wales. We wanted to make sure that the Celtic nations were also represented, needless to say. Um, we, in addition to the theoretical research, we conducted a wide range of interviews with a, uh, with a good number of people in, in fields such as arts, sports, science, uh, academia. It was 
a very beautiful, very uh, exciting experience. We got to know lots of people whom we wouldn't have met otherwise. When the book was published, and the book uh, touches upon areas such as fundamental rights, human rights, equality, prohibition of discrimination, the rule of law, democracy, these are really big issues for our society. As part of my role, I, in the law school before, I was director of a student experience. Then I went to schools in Greater Manchester and elsewhere. And I spoke with uh, lots of uh, teachers and obviously people involved in, in the educational sector, in the primary and secondary school level, mainly secondary school. And they were just saying, well, the same of things, Javier, you're talking about, are really important to our students. And that prompted, after lots of discussions with Helen, this idea of, well, it would be fantastic to create a board game which is going to really deal with, particularly design in principle for this age uh, uh, group like uh, we're talking about people from above uh, 11 until 17, mainly. But I think it's very, very important to address their needs and to be able to share the significance of these important achievements that we as a society here in the United Kingdom have uh, got. And obviously equality and freedom and respect and all these values are so, so important. Then as you can see, the game obviously was prompted by those uh, conversations, which I was having in my teaching capacity, but was the result of the book, all the research we have done about fundamental rights and freedoms and the rule of law and democracy. Therefore, it was the outcome of both the teaching and the research side. Therefore, I, I consider is genuinely connected with uh, both uh, sectors. Obviously, we started with uh, schools. It was wonderful, but then we were, we have had uh, lots of collaboration with arts galleries and museums, and we were just so flattered <laughs> moment when we saw that these uh, lovely people who do such an amazing job for our society, they were very keen on testing the games and just having a discussion with us about these important matters. And then we engaged with these uh, establishments, but also we were approached by a law firm. And then because I'm, well, as you can tell, uh, Spanish speaking, <laughs> my accent, you know, you could have never thought, I know. But uh, interestingly, I, I was also in, in a trip in Latin America and I tested, uh, I just thought, Helen and I working closely with each other, I thought we should have a Spanish version of this game because that's also something which I'm very excited about, that you and I are very passionate about this commercialization of social sciences, but crucially also the international element, because I think that's really important for us people working in British Academia, we need to look beyond our borders. Then we tested it in uh, Latin America when I was in Chile and then Helen and I were in North America and we visited, and I strongly recommend it, the Plymouth Foundation, which is a beautiful place near Boston and the Pilgrim Fathers. And so, well, it was just wonderful to see how these places were really, really interested in the game. Then it started as an educational tool, but we could see step by step that this is the sort of uh, experience because we're talking about uh, values which are deeply embedded, fortunately, in our society, but we would be tremendously naive if we said not everybody is treated equally in our society, nobody is discriminated against this, uh, the place where we live, the United Kingdom, as much as I love it with all my, all my heart, and I need, we need to celebrate all the stuff we have in this society, but at the same time, 
we shouldn't be naive and we shouldn't be obviously unduly lenient concerning all the shortcomings of our society. Then we started saying that there was interest in the educational sector, but then also there was interest coming from museums, art galleries, but when we were obviously in contact with law firms and so on, we also saw that social sciences has this tremendous potential in terms of commercialization beyond the educational circles. That was the progression. Mm. Okay, and so you talked a lot there about lots of different types of people. You talked about art galleries, you talked about museums, you talked about law firms. And the law firms and museums and art galleries, those aren't groups that I would typically put together. Um, <laughs> They are, they have their own distinct um, eccentricities and um, opportunities that, that each present. Um, what do you feel like, do you feel like um, when you are starting to build those types of relationships, what do you feel are the commonalities between all of those, between all of those groups? And, and what do you feel like are the kind of the qualities that you bring as a researcher to those types of of organizations? No, I, I think that's a wonderful, wonderful question. I think uh, without a shadow of a doubt, you have highlighted uh, really important issues here. These uh, games have been used by a wide range of groups and the differences are stark. But uh, when it comes to the crunch, we are dealing with aspects and this is a, a somebody who is an academic lawyer and also within the field of social sciences. We have a duty in terms of our research towards the wider society. Therefore, obviously for educational purposes, it's unquestionable. The profile of people who go to art galleries and museums, I have fantastic colleagues here at uh, Manchester who are trying to do research about uh, how we can increase the spectrum of people who go to these places. Unfortunately, expanding it to people from underprivileged backgrounds and so on, which I think is a commendable aspect. But uh, what brings the commonalities, as you were saying, Mormon, that bring all this organization together is that the sort of areas that social scientists we are concerned about really matter to society as a whole. Then irrespective of where you are, you will need to be knowledgeable and, and obviously have a, a good, a thought, I would say, rather than good understanding of all these uh, societal uh, challenges then the equality legislation, the Human Rights Act. These are not just matters for us academic lawyers. We need to be aware of the legal framework concerning the most important values. What brings us together as men and women in our society, and this is so powerful that obviously you can share it with the students, but you can share it with members of the general public. I took part alongside Helen in the Women's International Day exhibition that took place in Nottingham in the beginning of uh, March. I was just the most exciting thing ever, Morgan. just talking with people coming from the general public and being fascinated by all this legislation and all the amazing progress that we have really uh, achieved as a society in the course of the last uh, few decades. Then out of all these groups, obviously, when we talk about organizations such as law firms and potentially other sorts of private companies, for those particular establishments, uh, the game could be used for all this equality training that is, uh, as you know, carried out in all these organizations, rightly so, because it's very important. But at times, and I don't want to be critical, I know that it may be really enjoyable and rewarding to some employees in some sectors, but I've also come across so many people that find those days a bit draining and not necessarily very well designed. But there are, of course, fantastic uh, models 
and not criticize. But I, I guess the game, and that was uh, the way it was used in this particular context, the game can really help uh, managers to overcome this sort of initial reluctance on the part of some people to engage with these matters. And it's just the important thing about uh, us, people like you and me working in academia, we are not just here to talk about ourselves. We belong to fantastic uh, places. Glasgow University, Manchester University, we're very privileged. We are really, really lucky, but it should be our duty. This is my take, uh, and I know it's yours too. This is our, it's our duty to reach out to the wider population. Then initially, yeah, you think an academic lawyer, <laughs> the way I started my career, I wrote all these pieces about Scotland or about uh, Catalonia or about religious freedom. This is the area uh, which I am particularly fascinated about, but the longer I stay in British academia, the more I'm aware of the significance of reaching out to the society. Otherwise, we become irrelevant. We are not just here. And theoretical doctrinal work is crucial. I'm not underestimating it for one second. And there must be scholars who do that. But we as researchers in British universities and in the rest of Europe and the world, we also need to provide a response to societal, uh, society's needs. And this is my, my role and I want to help our society with this game, and I, I hope it will provide them with some responses to some queries, some legitimate queries that they have. And so when, you're, when you were talking there, you were talking um, really passionately and eloquently about reaching out and about um, the ability of um, academics to reach out to the general public and to different types of people all over all over different sections of our society. Um, and we know that sometimes early career researchers, PhD students, they can struggle a little bit with that. They don't know necessarily, might not know where to start. Um, it can look um, really quite difficult. What tips would you give from your experience um, to PhD students, early career researchers, to start to, to do that work, to start to reach out, to start to build their to build their profile, but also to, to actually get their research out into the world and, and make that societal impact that is so vital. Yeah, no, I think uh, without a shadow of a doubt, that's uh, more than a, a very relevant question. I've always been uh, very fortunate, having been assisted throughout my academic career, and having received the aid and the help and the support of uh, fantastic colleagues. But it's very true, we need to be completely honest about it. The whole idea of uh, commercialization of uh, social sciences, for instance, didn't feature in the mindset of many of my predecessors and senior colleagues. Then it was really, really difficult. At the same time, Obviously, our uh, early career researchers, our PhD students, they are really our pride and they are the future of our uh, universities. And I just uh, cannot emphasize enough how important it is to provide them with support. I was talking with colleagues uh, earlier this week about the fact that it's so important to have, because teaching is, uh, you tend to work in teams and it's brilliant. Um, research sometimes can become very lonely. Then it's very, very important to enhance a very collegiate research culture. I would say this is an important element in this uh, endeavor. When it comes to uh, getting to know people from outside academia, obviously we have fantastic people who work in excellent units like yours here in Glasgow or in Manchester. We have brilliant colleagues who can provide them with uh, tools and put them in contact with the relevant uh, people. But I would say that my, in addition to those uh, two uh, pieces of advice I've just shared with you, I would probably tell them, follow your heart 
And this may sound a bit cheesy, but frankly, this is how I see it. Be passionate about it. Because what I see sometimes is like, there is all this emphasis on networking nowadays. And I think it's, it's fair. We shouldn't be unduly critical. It's, it's important to get to know people in a different uh, set of uh, circumstances and also in different settings. I do not uh, underestimate that for one second. But if you are not really passionate about it and you are only doing it for the sake of meeting people, I think you are bound to fail. And it's so transparent when you meet partners in business or industry. Therefore, if your interest is something which obviously uh, you can find in areas such as arts and culture and so on, go for it. People would say there is little money, there's not enough funding. But I also, I mean, I have to say, uh, I've been so fortunate and I couldn't be more grateful to British Academia. And I'm not saying I've done a lot. I, I am content. I'm very happy with my career, but there are many people like me. But I have to say that when I first started, there were a few people, the vast majority of colleagues were brilliant and very supportive and extremely encouraging. But there were also a couple of people who said, listen, Javier, you don't have a degree in English law or British law. Uh, as you know, well, obviously, you know, there are significant differences between the legal framework of England and Scotland in terms of private law and so on. Then they would probably say English rather than British. And you don't have this knowledge. Um, it's okay, you are too niche. <laughs> you should. And he, he wasn't a bad person, but I think he gave me very bad advice. Like, uh, no, you shouldn't pursue your dreams. You will be always struggling. And I think if you follow your heart, if you do believe in yourself within reason, <laughs> not becoming a loony, completely deluded, I'm not saying that, <laughs> but I think you can really make inroads. Then if your heart is in arts, and um, we have wanted to work with um, galleries and museums and so on amongst other bodies, and it can work, then aim for a good number of uh, organizations, work with people in industry, be obviously selective, but follow your heart and be, and I think we all have to be in academia, we are, sometimes people say we're very big headed and so on. I want to believe that the vast majority of us are not, but maybe it's true that sometimes we struggle to ask for uh, help. It's very important to be very, very humble, I would say from the outset and just say, Morven, give me advice about in this particular sector, what do you think? Just talking with colleagues who have more expertise than you. Then from day one, as an early career researcher, just request. And that guidance must come from people. I mean, that's why we have in university great professors and people who have a lot of experience. They should, and I think on many occasions they do, they should be taking the lead and helping us out. Thank you very much for that of you. I think we've got one, one, I've got one final question that I've asked everyone um, that I think is, is really important and then, and then we'll wrap up. But what do you, so you talk there about following your heart um, and doing what you love. What do you wish the world knew at large about social science that you think they don't know right now? Well, I just um, would like, uh, this is <laughs> it's a very moving, it's a very powerful question because, uh, well, you know, there is always this discussion amongst scholars uh, about what a social science is, uh, whether law is a social science or not, and some people would disagree, should we? I generally believe that uh, social sciences are uh, an important part of uh, our project as a collective uh, group to obviously give uh, a response to people's uh, challenges. Now I want uh, the world, <laughs> the world is a big thing actually, <laughs> but you ask me, you ask me, but I would like people to think that social sciences, sociology, anthropology, law, 
etc. You name it. We are just there, obviously, to conduct theoretical and doctrinal work, amongst other things, and that's commendable, and that shouldn't be uh, underestimated, but we are mainly there to provide guidance, support, and a response to the ongoing challenges that we uh, human beings are facing every single day. Then I just feel like uh, sometimes we, <laughs> this is interesting because yeah, I think we need to be humble. Uh, we are not, I, I see that uh, the University of Oxford, amongst others, is trying to find this vaccine for COVID-19. And they are obviously providing society with such an invaluable service. And it's so important to recognize that uh, medicine and science, they are crucial for us, humankind. But at the same time, we social scientists at times feel like uh, a bit, uh, well, maybe what we offer is not that important. Well, it is. We shouldn't be big headed, but at the same time, we don't need to be just like unduly humble saying, no, we're not doing anything. I mean, talking about the sort of things that you and I, Morgan, have been discussing in the last uh, few minutes, discussing the significance of democracy, stressing the value of a legislation which has made the UK one of the most forward-thinking and progressive societies in Europe and the world. Stressing and enhancing those values is not a minor endeavor. Therefore, I think from that point of view, with our research, with our teaching, we as scholars have an important duty to fulfill and I want to feel that uh, fellow citizens are going to feel like we are from the academic world providing them with uh, guidance, assistance, help, and um, illuminating them if need be, etc. And I think we have an important role to fulfill too. Well, thank you very much, Javier. That is a wonderful place to end. Thank you so much for your time, for your enthusiasm, and for all your help. Um, Please do get in touch with us if you've got any questions, if you'd like to ask Javier anything, if you would like to get in touch with any um, of our wonderful uh, scholars, either at the University of Manchester or the University of Glasgow, just let me know. <laughs>